Hey, thanks for checking out The Dad Complex. I'm Jonathan Silva, and today I have my friend Gabriel Reyes on. Uh, he's with Victory Homes. I'm super excited to talk with him, so I hope you enjoy it. Gabriel, John. welcome to The Dad Complex, dude. The Dad Complex? That's what it's called. Got it. Yes. Nice. So... Thanks for, for joining me. And I really, I'm excited. We've been friends for a couple of years now. Yeah. And um, I, I think we've both talked about like our first interaction and how it was pretty quick. Like, oh, there's a vibe. Yeah, right? for sure. Like, and not in a weird way, but like, yeah, it's hard, I, I think, especially for me now, um, to make friends outside of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or absolutely. make deep connections. I feel like dads in general, that's, that's rather difficult in general for dads to not make friendships outside of work. Yeah, for sure. And so something that I love about y'all, um, and, and first, I guess let's point this out. Victory Homes. Yeah. You guys um, build a boutique custom home builder. Yes. The way I would explain it. Yeah. I think you agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, beautiful homes, uh, countless awards, um, tons of like engagement and interaction throughout the country and probably the world, I'm sure, on some of your designs and some of your like details and stuff. I mean, just phenomenal work, hands well, I down. That. Yeah, for sure. And we've gotten to work with you. Um, you were actually the first person I told that tadpole was happening. Yeah, I, remember. I think. And you were the first person who was like, "Well, let me know. I'm I'm ready to go." Yeah. And it was awesome, like to to know way before that even happened that we had people that were supporting us, or yeah. that, like appreciated what we did. Yeah, um, I remember. I mean, that was like maybe, what, like two months after we first met each other. And, yeah. then, and then you're like, hey, we're going to try to start this thing. And I actually remember showing you and uh, Kate a house. And then you're like, hey, let's get on a conference call. This is like, y'all were super ground floor at that point. Yeah. And now look at you guys. Like, I know, man. I think even like it took a few months to invoice you because we didn't even have a bank account. Yeah. Like it was... <laughs> Yeah, check still in the mail. Yeah, super yeah. ground floor. Um, so beyond that, beyond who you are at work or whatever, um, your dad to three girls and a boy. Mm -hmm. Yep, four And kids. I, I, something I want to point out is this is probably the easiest interview I've ever had to prepare for because you and Alex are um, really great at, like, staying connected with your audience and, like, with your people on socials. So yeah. let me. this is what I found out, right? So your youngest, Olivia, is four. Yep. Emma is six. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mason, also known as Riker. Yeah, Riker is what I call him, yeah. Okay. He, uh, he just turned 10. Yep. Right? Okay. And then Natalia is around 12, which is like my nightmare. Natalia is actually 13. 13. Yeah. Okay. So I was Yeah, around close there. though. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've been with Alex for... 13? Yeah, so we've been married for 13 years, um, met each other in 2006, so however many years that is. Yeah, and you and Alex both work um, actively within Victory, and Alex also is a got a, recently got a real estate license. Yes, I say recently, it's probably been a couple of years. It, year. Well, no, 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 it's been recent. She got it in April, I believe, of this year. Yeah, so she's always been... Um, very supportive, obviously, and she's she's helped me over the years in a, a ton of different roles for the business. And and this year, with sending all of our kids to school, she decided that she was going to get a real estate license. And so, yeah, she's enjoyed that. Um, it's very flexible, helps her with our family, and it's great for our family. But, you know, business model, family model, all the things. Yeah, so, it just makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How did you and Alex meet? Ah, uh, okay. Um, so me and Alex actually met at SPC in Leveland at the Leveland campus. So I was, uh, it's kind of a funny story. So I was, um, it was my first day of school, Alex's last semester at SPC. Um, I have always been a procrastinator by nature. And so, uh, I enrolled for school the day that it started, got ended up ended up having to be in yoga of all things. Cause I, I wanted to be a coach. Yeah. And so, um, uh, the, the financial advisor lady was like, Hey, 
you can either be in water aerobics, which is full, full of old people, or you can be in yoga. And I was like, put me in for yoga. And so I actually walked into the room, um, saw Alex. She was kind of five girls in, all up along a table. I've always been extremely extroverted. And so um, nobody was talking, kind of just that awkward first day of school vibes. Yeah. And so I kind of just said, well, hey, let's just go around and introduce all of ourselves. And so I started, said Gabriel Reyes, where I'm from, and then really just got to Alex. And after Alex told me who she was and where she was from, I kind of just spaced out, didn't care what anybody else said. And so <laughs> uh, ended up going home that weekend um, to Littlefield. I lived in Lubbock at the time. And uh, my mom was like, how, how was your first week of school or whatever? And I remember looking her straight in the eye, and she'll tell you this to this day. I said, man, I don't care about any school, but I met my wife, and her name's Alex. She's from Post, Texas. And, <laughs> uh, and yeah, so then a few years later, we dated and military stuff, and then we ended up getting married and all that jazz. So, yeah, that's how I met her, was in yoga class at Level End, Texas. So. Dude, South Plains coming yeah, through. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Heck, yeah. So, um, speaking of, like, your military background, you were in the Army, mm -hmm. um, which I, I believe was pretty soon after y'all met. Right? Is when you yeah. enlisted? Yeah. So I wanted to join the military right out of high school. Um, my mom and dad, portion of my story is that my mom and dad didn't graduate from high school. And mm -hmm. so uh, we grew up in a low to mid socioeconomic household. Um, I School always came easy to me. And so um, I wanted to go to the military right out of high school. Had a couple of buddies sign up for the military. My mom wanted a college boy. So that's really the only reason I even signed up for SPC. Um, yeah. you know, kind of did the freshman thing. My freshman year didn't read too many books, drank a lot of beer, and then, uh, ended up joining the military because I kind of wanted something better for myself. So ended up joining the military in October of, uh, 2006 and, uh, served six years in the U S army, um, did a 16 month combat tour in Afghanistan and all that stuff. So yeah, so actually met Alex before I signed up in the military and then um, we dated essentially my entire tenure yeah. in the military. Yeah. And so Veterans Day was a few days or weeks ago at the time, of, as of today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we were recording this. And um, we saw, or I saw Alex post about um, your first Veterans Day yeah. home. Yeah. And Natalia's with you. She's tiny. Yeah. And uh, honestly, it made me feel something, dude. Like, I... I I don't want to say I teared up, but it was like, I'm about to tear up. I'm yeah. just reading it like, man. And I remember that the, like, so I, w I was working on the railroad when we had Penelope and Darren. And I remember thinking how many things I missed out on. Yeah. Or like, you know, the birthdays, the, the Easter's, the, the worrying about like, am I going to be home on Thanksgiving? And it's nowhere near, like, that's not even close to what it's like being overseas or being enlisted and not like, I, at least, worst case scenario, 12 hours, I could get on the phone and call them. Sure. For you, I know it was probably, I mean, a totally different. Yeah. And so, like, I, I, it, I don't want to say broke my heart because it's, that's, you did what you did for your family and you made the changes for your family and, like, all of that's just kind of the adventure, like, the ride to get sure. to where you are here. But it, it was like, oh, man, I know what that... I have an idea of what that feeling is like. Yeah. So what has that, what has your career path or like, what did the army and that career there, how did that affect your, like how you parent today or how, who you are as a person um, in your oh, marriage? Um, so I would say that, uh, so it is, it is, so veterans day is a very uh, hard holiday typically for me, um, just in general, um, which I appreciate when everybody tells us, thank you for your service and, and those things in general, for me, my personal story, um, while I was in country, um, we ended up losing, we went on a mission and ended up losing, um, a total of, uh, eight KIAs and it, all those happened between November 11th and November 16th. Um, and so, Couple that with just uh, various uh, experiences that we've had since we've been back of, you know, guys, you know, um, 
uh, committing suicide and things like that. It's always just been, it's kind of a, a reminder, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I always tell everybody that I walk into or whenever people tell me like, you know, hey man, it looks like you're having a bad day or whatever, right? Like, um, I guess a portion of my story is that I tell people, man, I'm blessed enough to have been in situations where I've almost died. Mm-hmm. And so um, no matter, I mean, I still have hard days like everybody else. I still get anxious. I still get stressed out. I still, you know, um, just have days where I'm like, man, I just, this is just too much. But in doing so, kind of what I do is I always go home and um, I'm able to, I tell everybody I was blessed enough to almost die. And so that gives me a very unique perspective of life. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll tell friends and stuff, man, you know, at least nobody tried to kill me today, you know? And so, yeah. um, when you have that perspective, I mean, and yeah, stuff can go wrong, but at the end of the day, as long as God gives us another day to wake up, we can always make something right. Right. Yeah. Like you might mess up on an account, but at the end of the day, nobody's going to die because of the decision that you didn't or did make, you mm-hmm. know? And so when you, it's a, it's kind of a morbid way of looking at it, I guess. Um, a lot of people that have seen combat or were in the military, they'll probably be able to, in some way, agree with that. Um, for civilians, a lot of people look at it like a very morbid way of, of seeing life. But um, for me, it's just a constant reminder of what I did miss. Um, whenever you saw that picture, so I left when Natalia was two months old. She mm-hmm. was she was born. I was there for two months, and then I got back two weeks after her second birthday. Jeez. And so for that entire time, I was on – I came back for leave. We got a two-week leave, and I came back for leave, and um, me and Alex, for for our marriage and putting our marriage first, we actually went to Mexico for four days out of that leave. So. Mm-hmm. For almost two years, I was physically around Natalia. For the first two years of her life, I was physically around her for maybe two and a half months. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's it it does hit home for us. Um, We do have I do have a very unique perspective on it, but I think it's a perspective that you know people can look at it as a curse or a blessing. Mm -hmm. And so I just choose to look at it as a blessing instead of a curse. So yeah, well, you know, and so something I want to say to is for one thank you for yeah. your service and you know it's hard because I, I don't think that many people have that opportunity to, to genuinely sit down with a veteran unless they're close to them yeah and even when they are close to them they don't have that kind of relationship where they can be open and look each other in the eye and just say thank you yeah yeah you know absolutely. because it's a deep it's pretty deep and i, yeah. I don't think a lot of for one men don't want to get that deep or can get that deep yeah but then two just to have that opportunity where every there isn't like a ton of things going on yeah but i mean my dad was in the service um he went to desert storm and he 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 doesn't talk about it yeah he doesn't talk about it all like he talks about his one friend who's a marathon runner and so he did the marines marathon and did all kinds of stuff and has trophies and to me like that's the extent of what i know about his military career yeah. Because he doesn't, he doesn't talk. He did it because his family was super poor and he would send his money back so that his sisters could go to school. Yeah. Uh, to university and they're all nurses now. And So like um, he made a sacrifice not only for the country, but you know, he did it for the betterment of his family. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. But I have no clue like anything else yeah. about like the, the, the hardships of it. And, well, see, and that's the thing that I don't want for my son. Um, so like Riker um, is very... Uh, as he's got older, like we mentioned, he's 10. And so the one thing that I don't want for Riker or Mason is um, as he's gotten older, he's taken a lot more. He's he's like becoming a man, you know, and, yeah. and as a portion of that, he's got this uh, – he's he's the only boy out of three girl out of four kids, you know, he's got three sisters, and so he's not – in the past has not been overtly masculine, right? Right. And so – you right. You grow up with three daughters or three sisters, and you're gonna you're gonna be surrounded by Barbies and pink and purple and this, that, and the other. And so, as he's gotten older, um, he's asked me 
um, probably more so than any other kid that I have, even Nathalia. Nathalia doesn't really ask me too much about it. Um, but Mason, I mean, he randomly will say, well, what did you do whenever you did this in the army or, or Mm -hmm. have you ever done this, you know, or have you ever done that? Or what was this like? And so, um, the approach that I've taken is that, um, kind of honesty is the best policy within, within his age, you know, obviously, but he's asked me before about what it was like being deployed and what it was like being gone from mom and, and his sister and, and um, he knows that I've had, you know, buddies that have died and, and things like that. And, and so when he asks me about it, you know, and not to say that your dad did anything wrong, I just try to be as open with him as possible. Because I do feel like, especially in, yeah, not just the military culture, or just men in general, but like, you know, the Hispanic culture. Mm-hmm. Like my, yeah. my dad is, uh, is obviously of Hispanic heritage. And so I feel like in our culture specifically, um, there's a huge machismo of, you know, you don't talk about your feelings and you don't mm. say how you feel and you don't say, I love you. And you don't say I'm proud of you and you don't say what you're feeling. And so we're, as I am trying to break that generational curse with him and with me of just being overly transparent and telling him, I love you. Here's what this is. So when he asks me a question about the military, I'll say, Hey, this is, this is what we were. This is what, happen this is what we're doing and i think uh there's a uh, th- the other day there's a picture um that i'm holding a picture of Nathalie and alex and we were like it was uh the seventh day of a 10-day op in the mountains and our uh food loads weren't landing correctly and so it was a really really dire situation and i think if you look at that picture, I'm like 184 pounds in the picture Mm -hmm. and I'm typically 200 pounds. And so, um, he was like, man, dad, you look like, and there's like, I mean, we'd been firing our weapons and we've been doing all these things and there's just grime all over our face. And it's, it's Mm -hmm. a very band of brothers esque picture. And he was just like, you know, what were you doing? And I was just like, man, we were, you know, we're just in the mountains and this is what we're doing and this is what we're supposed to be doing. And, and he just gets blown away by that stuff. So yeah, yeah, for us, we just we're trying to be as honest as we can. You know, it, it might be the wrong thing, but you know, only time will tell type of deal. Yeah, that's kind of that's the same approach we've taken with our kids is just being super flat out and honest. You know, we had um, Penny's getting to the point now. She's really good at math. Yeah, um, she struggles with school in general. Like she's she's been diagnosed with AD, ADD and. Um, dyslexia and she's overcoming and it's, i mean she aside because i'm really proud she just got honor roll for the first time man hey there weeks. you go so like, I'm, I'm super proud of her and kate and i both struggled with school um with like the traditional like format of school and um anyway so we've always like tried to be honest with them so yeah. whenever she does the math like wait if i'm eight and you guys have been together for this long and you got married here. That means you were pregnant before yeah, yeah, yeah. you were married. And um, to our story, right, Kate and I met when I first, Kate was actually the first like girl that I met, like introduced myself when I moved to Lubbock or when oh, I moved nice. to Level Land to South Plains. And um, I knew from that day, like I was just, same thing Dude, like, it's like that thing you know South you Plains know is the spot i know um <laughs> so we, we met at a, at a mutual friend's house we're working on a on a video project um but anyway so fast forward to like october september 2013 um i had been traveling with like mu- with bands and stuff and um some really good friends and i kate and i had been dating for a while and i realized on this tour um, I was in the back of the van and I was like, man, I don't want to be here anymore. Like yeah. I'm in the middle of, it, it was awesome. I was, you know, I didn't really have to pay for anything. I didn't make any money, but I didn't have to pay for anything. And I was seeing the country and I was with really good friends. Um, but I was like, man, I'd rather be home. Like I'd rather be with Kate right now. I, I'm, this isn't like for me anymore. Um, and so I got back that summer and then in September I proposed to her and then October 31st we found out we were pregnant nice yeah <laughs> so that that's been our uh that's been our life um 
and you just got to grow up really, really quick. Yeah, absolutely. But back to like the honesty thing is, is this point of needing to be honest and being open. And, you know, I let the, I, there was a time where Kate was like, you need, you should probably think about like tapping into your feelings in front of the girls so that they can see that. Yeah. You know, so they can experience that. Both of, both of our parents are, are not very emotional. Yeah. Outwardly emotional people. Um, and so like being able to do that and letting them know that it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to like talk about them outwardly and understand what it is. Is to me, to us, it's been really important and really exciting to see their like personalities grow and see them grow emotionally as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I feel like, you know, that's the important thing of, um, you know, like the women that we marry, right? Like, uh, my faith, I'm pretty grounded in my faith just in general, just mm-hmm. kind of always have been. And, and I feel like, like even with you and Kate, right? Like to have a woman in your life that you love, be able to tell you like, Hey, um, I think you need to do this so that it benefits our daughters. You know, yeah. it's kind of interesting thing being a girl dad. Um, I tell Alex pretty regularly, like, trying to raise Mason to be a better husband than I am and to, and to the way that I treat Alex is going to be the way that Mason eventually treats his wife. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and for daughters specifically, like I feel like girl dads have that bird, not a burden, but that, uh, responsibility even more so. Right. Cause you opening up about your feelings and, and how you communicate that with Kate or with your daughters, you know, that's opening up a healthy pattern so that when your daughters do start dating, they're going to be able to see, oh, well, this is the way that a man is supposed to act, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I shouldn't have to tippy toe around his emotions or his feelings, you know? Right. And so, and I feel like, and, and we, you know, same, I try to do that with all of our daughters, especially Nathalia, now that she's 13, you know, um, you're, she's getting into that pre, pre, you know, I guess now she's a teenager. I used to say she's a preteen, but, um, now she's a teenager. And so all of the things are happening and you're just like hoping that you'll set the rhetoric that she uses to, you know, establish whoever she's looking for in a significant other. So, right. Well, and it's the, the ex- yeah, the expectations yeah. of like, here's what you need to expect from your future husband that's right from your future wife or um anything like that and i I love that um there's people like it gives me hope for sure for who my kid is going to marry knowing that there's other dads and other moms that think about that stuff yeah absolutely you know yeah because it it scares me man like i don't know oh it's the worst you think about yeah it's the it's a, a really bad thought thinking about who's going to um marry your daughter or you know vice versa even your son you know like right um yeah i think i think that's really really healthy for you and kate and for kate to be able to tell you hey john you need to you need to open up to your girls and i think it's powerful dude i mean i really do um that girl that your girls can see hey this is how i'm feeling and you don't you know because again nothing against your dad but you're allowing them to see who you are as a person Right. right. That you can't carry everything. And honestly, you're not supposed to, right? Like that's mm-hmm. why you have a molecular family. That's why you and Kate are bound in marriage to carry these things together. You yeah. Know? So for sure. Um, what type of home were you and Alex raised in? Oh, um, so man, I don't know how deep you want to get here. Uh, so my dad, uh, and he, he would tell you this to his, to this day, and it's nothing negative against him. It's just, it's just his, his curse and, and you know, his, his walk. Um, my dad was an alcoholic growing up. Um, I, I mean, he would probably tell you he still is to this day. Um, both my parents didn't graduate from high school. They both grew up in Littlefield, um, mm-hmm. where I was raised. My dad, um, went to, or he worked at the cotton plant there in Littlefield my entire life, basically until it shut down. Is that the Levi's plant? Yeah, yeah, okay. American Congros, yeah. And um, it's now the dairy. And so 
yeah, he worked there all his whole life. Um, Littlefield is your kind of just textbook novel small town, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's a steel mill, a granary, you know, a cotton plant. Um, everybody typically gravitates towards that thing, and that's what is the heartbeat of the town. And that's right. the way it was with me growing up. Um, so my dad worked shift work. He was a seven to seven worker, um, seven to three, you know, depending on the year and, um, pretty much just your, you know, I don't know how else to say it and I don't mean in a negative way, but just your typical small town Hispanic household. Um, they worked to work and they worked for the weekends and on the weekends we barbecued and we, you know, or they drank Bud Light and, (laughs) you know, and we just lived life. Uh, my mom has been a janitor for probably over 20 years. Um, and, and so for Alex, so for me growing up, um, seeing that I very much followed in the footsteps, all my scene, all my high school career. And whenever I joined the military, it was because of that. I didn't want, um, I just wanted something better. I can't mm-hmm. say what I did or didn't want. I just wanted something better for my life. And I knew that the military was going to cut all that off. So I just kind of, I was kind of in a situation where I just needed to cut it off yeah. at the source. And so, and Alex was, Alex is probably like, she's my absolute favorite person. And so her dad came over. He was originally born in Reynosa, Mexico, um, came over when he was 17. Alex is a first generation American. Her dad, her mom grew up in post. They met, loved each other, did all the things. Um, but her dad was also a very traditional Mexican father. And so, Mm -hmm. um, she was, she is like the smartest person I know. Um, and she just never, Alex has never done, never not done anything exceptionally. And so I think a lot of that came from being the oldest and having a traditional Mexican dad and knowing the sacrifices that he made and basically just wanting to be the absolute best at everything that she did. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we grew up and, and, um, our very first house was right here in commander's palace, man. I took her home. Yeah. Yeah. I took her home to commander's palace trailer park and, uh, (laughs) our gated community rather. We were pretty proud of that. And, um, and, you know, that's where we started our lives together. Had holes in the floor, had foil on the windows. And Dude. yeah, the half the half the house didn't get hot or cold because the AC was broken. But yeah, we made it work, man. That's so cool. I mean, you know, it's cool relatively. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> relatively now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I know that, <clears throat> sorry. So Alex's <clears throat> father passed recently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how has that affected y'all um, in your marriage and, like, how you see your, your family now? Um, so, man, that's tough. That's a tough question. Uh, so Alex's dad, yeah, so he's he's been gone for a year, and it feels like it was yesterday. But, uh, um. So me and my father don't have, I mean, we have a good relationship now. We don't, me and my father's relationship is a very non-traditional father-son relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when Alex's dad passed, um, it, it was almost like, I mean, it was very hard for her. And it was, he was just, he was always the guy who was, uh, he was serious, but he was always joking, which is really weird to say. It's kind of a conundrum. Um, but he just always knew how to make you laugh or even the things that he would say would just make you laugh. And so it has definitely changed our family dynamic. Um, primarily because, you know, we have kids. So like Nathalie and Mason, they knew Alex's dad. And they were old enough to understand what happened. And, and you know, Natalia will forever and always have fond memories of her papa. And same for Mason. Um, Emma, my six-year-old, is is was on that 
cusp of, you know, when you're five, you know, I feel like you really only remember things from when you're like maybe three. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she remembers him um, pretty fondly. What's wild, probably the most wild thing for us and me and Alex, like we actually, this happened yesterday is uh, we were eating dinner. We always try to make it a point to eat dinner as a family. And my four year old Olivia, so she was three at the time when my father in law passed. And um, I said, Hey, Olivia, how was your day? And she says, Well, I was crying today. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, something happened. And um, Alex says, No, Miss So and so texted me and said that Olivia was on the playground today just bawling. And um, I was like, Well, you know, did somebody hit her? What's going on? And she goes, No, she just said that. When they asked her, she just said that she misses her papa so much. And that's what they called Alex's dad. And so I just looked at Alex and I was like, you know, and so it's, it's just this very weird thing that has, that happened to us. And I know it happens to a ton of people, but like for our, our four-year-old daughter, like kind of just kicked us straight in the teeth again yesterday because I was like, what do you mean you miss papa? And she was like, I just miss him so much. And, and so apparently she cried she had events of crying all day yesterday. Yeah. And, um, Jeez. and just randomly, like there wasn't anything that could have reminded her or anything like that. And, and, you know, Alex is just like, well, you know, and, she, and even Olivia, she's like, Papa's with Jesus, you know, she goes, but I want Papa here, you know? And so, yeah, it's just things like that, um, that have been really tough. Uh, obviously Alex being the oldest, in a Hispanic family, her, everybody mostly looks to her mm -hmm. to kind of help make the decisions now of where do we have Thanksgiving and where's Christmas and who's checking on my suegra or her, you know, her mom. Right. So, yeah, man, it's been, it's been really tough. Um, you know, every time that I talk to like new dads or like I'm talking to someone who's thinking about ha having kids, <clears throat> I always tell them like, as Parents, the secret is, is that no one knows what the hell is going on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like everything is just a constant, like learning. Because even even from kid to kid, even it like you know we have a an eight year old and a six year old. So even those experiences that we had when Penny was five or younger, you know, and, and now going through them with Darren, they're completely different, and I have no clue how to because they're different personalities. Yeah, for sure. You know, so you really don't know anything. Um, but it it is very very different whenever you're also trying to process deep oh, emotions yeah. like that like yeah. i don't even know how because you can't process yourself before you help your kids like you always help yeah. your kids process first it's like that airplane thing you know when they say like don't put your mask on first before your kids yeah. like i would love to to meet the person that wouldn't put their the mask on the kid first oh yeah like it's absolutely. not gonna happen like, i know they yeah. have to say that but it's not realistic yeah. i mean even if it's not you know? like there i think there's some ancestral thing like even if it's not my kid, right? Right. Like if there's a kid next to me, just you having kids, there's going to be something inside of you that obviously wants to take care of the kid first. Right. You know? There's yeah, like absolutely. some sort of uh, connection there. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. So moving on, what was it like? And I, I know that you got to do this before um, things like changed within your, your family unit, but what, what was it like when you got to what was that moment when you were successful or like when Victory Homes was successful? Because I know you, you guys were already successful with artistry. Yeah. So you'd kind of already gone through that with, with your brother and like your family there. But what was it like now, like when Victory is, is yours and Alex's like business and, and your, your business baby there? Like what was it like telling your, your parents and your family? Like, or when, I guess when it all clicked to everybody, like, oh, this is very successful. Um, that's an, that's kind of an interesting question. So like for us, man, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I have people come up to us all the time. They're like, oh man, you know, we're so proud of you and so glad, so happy to see everything that you're doing. And I think that that's great. Um, for us, me and Alex just feel like we're still me and Alex. Right. And so, yeah even in the business standpoint, like, I don't know that there's ever been a click thing on us that it's like, we've made it right. Like mm -hmm. I, uh, 
I was listening to this other podcast because that's what I do when I'm driving on the road all the time. And and the guy was like, man, you know, whenever I made this first X amount of dollars, I figured that there would be something in, innately inside of me that was like, boom, you've made it. Yeah. And he was like, that doesn't, he goes, you know, the only thing that changed was the number in your bank account. He was like, you know, and mm-hmm. and he went on to say that, he believed, and, I, and I, I mean, he said it. He said it the best way that I can, that I think is like. He went on to say he was like, if, if success or some 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 form of success or some definition of success defines who you are innately or who your character is, then that success is never going to be yours anyway. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and I think that's the way that it is for us. Like we, we strive every day. And I wake up and go to sleep every night. And do I have do I have restless nights? Sure, but for the most part, man, I sleep decently. And and we're not perfect. I mean, I I feel like I upset people daily, right? Like you said it. Like I'm a boutique custom home builder, and with that, uh, I have to be everywhere at once, you right. know, and. But I always tell people, like, people wouldn't build with us if I was just building one house a year, right? And Mm -hmm. so um, so for us, our success isn't defined by what we've attained in our business. Our success for me is defined by the quality of life that I've been able to create with for my family and my children and for others, you know, the people that work for us, right? Yeah. Um, The employees that we have. And so, I don't know. I mean, we haven't had that aha moment of like, oh, man, we've made it. You know, I I feel like we are reminded daily of how blessed we are. And we yeah. also forget daily of how blessed we are. Like even you, right? Like if you mm-hmm. want to go pick up your girls, you can go pick up your girls, right? Yeah. Like you'll probably need to move some things around. But for the most part, you can do that. And so for me, it's like I have the ability to do that. I have the ability to go on a three-day weekend if I really need to, you yeah. know? And, and so success for me, I guess, was most defined whenever I hit the spot where we weren't fighting, we weren't paying bills weekly. Yeah. It was like, hey, we're comfortable. And so that's probably the most aha moment that I've ever had of like, Hey, you're not living paycheck to paycheck. Hey, we bought, you know, mm-hmm. or I guess I'll say it this way. Here's a bit. So sorry, super long way of getting there. <laughs> right. I'll say it this way. So my ter- determination of success, I didn't grow up with a garage door. Mm-hmm. Everybody that was in my mind, everybody that was rich in Littlefield, Texas grew up with a garage door. I didn't grow up with one. So, my aha moment, if I ever had to have one, was one day Alex walked in and we lived in a small house in Wolford, Texas on McMillan Avenue. And I was just turning, I was closing the garage. I'd wait for it to close. I opened it. And I did that probably for five minutes. And she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, everybody that grew up in Littlefield, Texas that had a garage, they like made it. And so like in my adolescent mind, yeah. that was success. Yeah. And so we moved in from the trailer house in Commander's Palace. We moved into McMillan Avenue, had a garage, and it was like a 1,400 square foot house. And I remember just thinking, this is it. Like yeah. nobody can ever look back down on Gabriel Reyes and say, he didn't make it. You know what I mean? And yeah. so that, that's my determination of success is having a garage door, I guess. Yo, but how many garage doors do you own right now? Yeah, that's right. Because you've got how many spec? I, I, so we've got, <laughs> um, so projects currently on the ground, we usually average 12 to 18. Obviously, the housing market's doing what it's doing. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few specs on the ground. But yeah, now now I've got more garage doors than I, than I cared to have probably. <laughs> that's so funny, man. <laughs> That's interesting, though. And, you know, um, for me, and I, I think I know you're the exact same way, where um, our, our parents worked into the ground 
to provide us an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And yeah. so for us, our aha moment was when same thing, like when we weren't living paycheck to paycheck anymore. And it's like, Oh, now we have an opportunity to save for that car when they turn 16. Oh yeah. Or now we have the opportunity to save for college. Like, cause we have those, we're in that financial yeah. situation that we can actually save money and not lose money or, you know, we're, we're netting something now. Yeah. And that, yeah. that was our aha moment, you know? And you're able to, you know, like, I mean, I'll use, I use the word pretty regularly, but like you're building a legacy, you and Kate are building a legacy for your daughters, you know? And, mm -hmm. and like you said, investing in college or investing in a house, I think me and you've talked about before of like, there's no better time if you're able to buy a house than today. And that will always, you could say that every single day for the rest of your life. Right. And that'll happen. And so like, I know we talked about investing in our children's future. And I mean, when we talked about what the houses that you and I are purchasing today, what that's going to amount to when our children are 18 or 22 years old is going to be crazy. Right. Yeah. Like I, I mean, my parents weren't in a situation to ever do this. But I look back on 10 years ago and I look back on what I purchased our McMillan house for and what it's worth today. Like I could go back and look at what that house is worth today and I could almost guarantee you that it's worth $150,000 more 10 years, like just 10 years apart than what it was whenever I first bought it. Oh, I know. You know, and so it's just crazy when you think about that. When Kate and I moved from our first house um, and we, we moved... We, Kate bought a house. Kate was a sugar mama for yeah, that's for a right. Bit. Uh -huh. but, but Kate bought a house. It was one hundred and thirteen thousand, and then on on Frankfurt, and then across the street were the nicer homes in Fountain Hills. So we, we moved from that house, moved to a really nice neighborhood, also probably kind of like a bucket list neighborhood. But we had like the cheapest house on the block, you know. Yeah, you did and then right. now we moved to the to to that nice neighborhood, and and we always look back like, dang, we should have kept that house because oh, yeah. it's worth like a hundred grand more than what it was <laughs> yeah. like and mortgage was so nice like 900 bucks like that was the life man oh dude i think me and alex i tell her all the time like we look at it all the time and i'm like dude just take me back to commander's palace yeah and no knock on any if, if for some reason you're listening to this and live in commander's palace like great community like i'll actually absolutely love it not to knock it uh but i joke with her all the time i'm like dude to go back i think me and Alex is like our monthly house and lot bill was like 550 bucks. Yeah, that's crazy. And we were, yeah. So like, and no taxes, no nothing. So we're just like, dude, we should just go back and, and uh -huh. live the minimalist lifestyle and I know do, do that thing, man. I, yeah. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> well, okay. Um, real quick question. Do y'all speak Spanish at home? No. I wish. I know, me too. Yeah, Alex is um, very fluent in Spanish. It was her first language. Mm -hmm. It was my first language as well. Didn't didn't speak it after I started school. Alex's yeah. dad, obviously being a Mexican uh, national, you know, that came over, uh, she is extremely fluent. I wish she would speak it, um, but you know, she she doesn't. I understand it very well or mostly well, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, I'm not great at speaking it b anymore because my mind doesn't do the conjugates. Very yeah. Well. We're trying to do a better job. And, and this is a total excuse, but we, because Kate doesn't speak Spanish, I always say, well, it's hard to speak in Spanish to my kids because there's no one to converse. Like there's no natural yeah. way of just. There's no feedback. coming. Yeah. Out, right? You just have to say yeah. it, you know, and it, it's weird. But I, I, we've been actively trying to do better and like. Oh, man, I think it's super something. important. Our son was in a dual language program at Cooper for the first two years while he was in school. And we loved it. Um, it's something I mean, it's it's something that we almost revisit every so often. But yeah. it's like, like you said, it's just an excuse. Like it's easier to speak to our kids. And I know for a simple fact, Natalia. Like, one, she's got a Spanish name, right? Uh -huh. Like, Natalia. It's not Natalie, it's Natalia. And so yeah. um, she's our traveler. Like, she's going to, you know, she when she turns 18, I have very little doubt or I wouldn't be surprised if she decides that she's going to go backpack Europe or whatever, yeah. you know? And so um, 
I wish it was a skill that we would be teaching them now because I know when she's 18, 19, 20 years old, she's just going to be like ticked at us for not incorporating that in our lifestyle. It, it, it's always like that. I think like yeah. kids are always mad at their, like they should have taught me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got to be mad at us for something. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. It's a, it's a good good excuse to be mad. Yeah. Um, so th- all of this to say, right, you're obviously in a totally different position than your parents were when they were raising you. How do you instill or how are you instilling like hard work ethic in your kids now? Um, so for us, so I don't know that they will, I don't know that you, I don't know that you can do it to the extent that I was given. So my parents didn't give us much, but I will say they give us, they gave us a hard work ethic. So I hoed cotton in the fields starting at nine years old. Wow. And like, I'm talking about waking up at six in the morning and getting done at six in the evening during mm-hmm. the summer. And so, um, for us, you know, I mean, and I'm, like I said, I'm a pr- fairly transparent person. Like I look at my kids and there's a lot of times where, you know, same thing for my dad. Like my dad used to call me ungrateful growing up, you know, and he didn't, you know, and I didn't have as hard of a life as he did, you know? And, right. And so, um, same thing with my kids. Like I'll look at my kids. I'm like, dude, y'all don't know how easy you got it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, just if I ask you to go throw the trash, don't give me faces about it. Just go do it, you know? And, right. But for us, we try to we try to just tell them, hey, for us, the currency in our household is respect. And so if they respect us and they do what we ask, then that's the currency of our household as far as chores are concerned. We're in a position where our kids really don't lack anything in their life. And so having to constantly remind them, hey, you have it very well. And also, you know, like Natalia has gotten into the age where she can babysit. Mm -hmm. And so what we've started doing is starting to have these conversations of like, okay, well, you do this. And so like obviously me as an entrepreneur and having that mindset saying, hey, what we're trying to instill or what I'm trying to instill in our kids right now is like time is your absolute most sacred commodity, right? Like our time is an exchange for whatever it is that we're either getting reimbursed or paid for. And so I'm trying to instill that in the Thali and Mason at an early age so that they don't be lackadaisical with their time. So like Natalia, for instance, she's 13. She gets paid $12 an hour when she goes to babysit, you know, mm-hmm. and, and we tell her, hey, you don't need to buy anything, so keep this. So I've made a deal with her. By the time she's 16, she's going to need a car. And so I said, save up whatever you can. I'm not going to finance a car for you. When that time comes, whatever you have saved, I'll match it, and we will go pay cash for whatever car. And that's the car that she's going to drive. Mm. And so we kind of look at these goals, and we look at this currency and try to see, okay, what are you working towards? Because right. for me, like me growing up, yeah, it worked out, right? Working all those hours and, and the hard work got instilled in me. But I only worked in the fields because that's what they told me to do. There wasn't really an end goal for me. The end goal was that I got new clothes whenever right. I whenever school started. And for our 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 kids were like, hey, you we we're happy you don't have to be in that situation, but you're also not gonna just sit at home and do nothing all day. Right. Um, for my son, and this is probably, you know, I don't know, I don't wanna say sexist of me, but so like my son during the summer at 10 years old, he goes to school with me three to four. He goes to work with me three to four days a week. And Mm so during the summer, I leave the house at 615. And so he wakes up with me every day and we go to work and whatever we're doing that day, if we're working with our hands or if we're in meetings, he's there with me doing whatever he's going to do. Well, you know, like a really understated, um, like skill that I think men have to have that women and then women have to have this too, but I think that comes harder for, for men if you're not around that, is having the confidence to just talk with, with other men. Yeah, absolutely. At a job site or, or whatever, and, and having that skill yeah. is really important. Well, what we hope, what I've told Alex, and he's not, like I said, my son is not, 
he's not me and and I and I don't want him to be right and, and as a father that's he is he is like me but different from me right obviously and so what I am hoping to instill him in the next few years is I want my son to learn the things that I know how to do with my hands so I do feel and I feel I feel very strongly about this I feel like the tradesman is a dying breed. I don't know how else to say that yeah. nicer. But so I feel like guys that work with their hands or guys that want to work with their hands. I'm 34. You know, I feel like once you crest below 26, the demographic of people that want to enter trade work or work with their hands is very minimal. Um, or you have this large demographic of people that want to do like extremely custom things. You know what I mean? Like very niche yeah. custom things. And so my hope is that Mason watches me enough and I'm able to teach him enough trade work that when he gets older, he wants to be a teacher. But I told him, I was like, that's great. But teachers don't make a lot of money. So you're probably going to have to DIY a lot of stuff. And yeah. so, so when we have these conversations, we're having these very practical conversations of, hey, it's not about money. But teachers, unless something changes radically, teachers aren't going to make a lot of money. So you need to learn how to do stuff with your hands. And so mm -hmm. when I'm fixing something, a plumbing, I mean, I know enough to get me in trouble on electrical, plumbing, sheetrock, framing, concrete work, all of the things, right? And yeah. so that's what we try to do. And so I've told him there's not a lot of dudes out there that are going to be his age. There's not a lot of dudes out there that are your age or even five years younger than you that want to work with their hands right mm -hmm. and i feel like in 20 years time when my son's 30 he's going to be able to charge somebody 85 dollars an hour to go out there and float a patch of sheetrock you yeah. know what i mean and so that may not be what he wants to do but at least he's gonna have the skills to possess to be able to provide for himself and or his family at that time you know uh Something funny, just because you said sheetrock. One time, I was putting, uh, we were adding recessed lights into our master bedroom. Yeah, super fun, <laughs> super fun. Calling through the attic, but I fell through the ceiling. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I could not. I luckily I had a friend. I was working for a construction company yeah, at the yeah, time, yeah. so I called a painter who was who came and helped me on the cheap. But oh my gosh, dude, sheetrock is a skill. Yeah. Especially ceilings. Yeah, yeah. And oh, like yeah. making that look super clean. Well, and the mm -hmm. thing about it is, is like, right, exactly what you did, right? Like, you only gain these skills by doing, right? And I feel like, obviously, that's with everything, right? Like, I can't do what you do because I don't do it every day. And that's not my passion. Right. Like, what, what Drew can do with a camera, like, I wish I could do, you know, but yeah. not my passion. But y'all do it every single day. But on the other side of it, like even just walking in an attic, right? Like you would think, oh, I can walk in an attic and not fall through the sheetrock. And mm -hmm. then, you know, you probably had a loose blown insulation attic. Yep. Thought there was a piece of board there and there wasn't. And there your foot goes. Yeah. You know, and then you're total dad in it probably up in the attic, like just cussing up a storm or being like, oh, man, you know. But yeah, totally, man. It's little things like that. Like, hey, know how to do this, know how to do that. And I feel like there's not going to be a lot of people out there that not, not to say they won't be able to, but they're not going to want to possess the skill to do those things. So, mm -hmm. and yeah, and you're right. It, it's a dying breed. I know there's ton of, tons of data out there. You know, oh yeah. Absolutely. Expressing that on, on a, another skill though, real quick to bring up just related to that. And maybe you can add it. I hope you can add into this was coming down from that attic and being terrified that Kate was going to be like, you know, yeah, yeah. Showing Kate that I did that. But then also needing to be like over exaggerating how bad I was hurt. So yeah. she wouldn't be that mad at yeah, me. For sure. <laughs> Just the sweet spot. Or be like, you weren't up there. You don't know what it's like up there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's dangerous. Yeah. For sure. Well, so in closing, what's your like pro tip? And I, I've been asking everybody. So if, if there's one tip, and I think I know what you're going to say, but if there, there's one tip to give out to a dad. A young dad specifically, well, what would that be? Uh, I guess 
I mean, I would just say like what we've already kind of discussed. So like, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it all right. You know, and you're not supposed to, you know, nobody is, but I feel like for dads, they just need to, I feel like every dad out there, like in me, including just needs to hear like, it's going to be okay. You know, and, and whether you had a dad, didn't have a dad or had a great dad, I feel like young dads specifically, they just need to hear like, Hey man, you got this right. Especially in our economy, in our world, it's a dangerous place, but just always lead with love, you know? And, and I think that's what I try to do every single day is I always lead with love in the fact of, man, I probably had a bad day, but my kids probably had a bad day too. And mm-hmm. my job is to show them that this world's not going to be perfect, but that we can love each other through it. And, and honestly, like I said, just the honesty policy, you know, like I mess up, you know, there's times where you talked about like your parenting style and how that military is militaristic style kind of shows its ugly face sometimes. And I'm not immune to that. And there's been times where I've taken my nine, you know, at the time, nine, eight, 10 year old daughter, son, and I've sat them down and I've said, Hey, I need you to forgive me. Hey, I Mm -hmm. overreacted when you did this thing. I need you to forgive me because that's not okay. You know, and, and, um, and I messed up and I need you to understand that dads can mess up too. And so I feel like just laying that groundwork and honestly, just every day, dude, just leading with love and knowing that you don't have to compare yourself to anybody. Cause I feel like that's the other thing, right? Is like, we live in a society where like on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, I feel like everybody always looks at these pictures. Like, like, don't get me wrong. Like me and Alex just took family pictures Hmm. and everybody's going to look at those pictures and be like, Oh my gosh, the races have it all together. How do they have four kids and a business and she's a realtor and they've got it all together. And dude, I could not tell you enough. Like me and Alex are literally flying by the seat of our pants almost every single day. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, but like in that one moment, right. You looks like we've got it all together, but the comparison is extremely deadly thing of like, dude, talk to another dad, find a relationship with it, like vibe with somebody and just be able to say like, Hey dude, here's what I'm going through. Yeah. And if you find, if you find your group, find your guys, then I think that that's probably the best thing. And uh, the last thing would just be find, And hopefully it's the mother of your children. Right. But I know that's not the case for everybody, but find the, your significant other and find somebody that, loves you through it as well. So you can't just lead with love. You also have to be attached and love people that love you through it as well. Love you through your shortcomings and all of your, you know, frustrations and, and all of your, your things. So. Yeah. There's definitely a balance between needing to love you while loving your kids more and understanding that there's like, there has to be communication. Yeah, hundred percent. To make that all work. But yeah, that would be my 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 key, man. Lead with love and don't compare yourself to others because we are literally all figuring it out. Like none of us have it all together. Yeah, we just put on a really good facade. So yeah, we're just trying really hard. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> cool, man. Well, I appreciate you for coming on. Um, and did you try your coffee? Did I you get tried it, man? Monomyth is Monomyth. great. Yeah. Have you been there? I have, yeah. Cool, dope. We shout, out some, shout out Mono Shout out Mono Everybody needs to go there and grab some coffee. Yeah, absolutely, man. But hey, seriously, thank you so much for for coming out and um, I, I learned some stuff about you and I got, I've I've always appreciated our friendship and like you, I know that I've always had you to count on. Like if, if there was something, you know, whatever, yeah. I know I, I could call you. So I, I appreciate you um, coming out and, and talking, getting this. Yeah, no, man, thanks for asking me. This is like the coolest thing I've gotten to do in a really long time. So, (laughs) Cool, man. Awesome. Well, cool. Thanks. Thanks, dude. See you guys.